Hello there, I'm Denise Howell, and you're about to listen to another special Gaming Law edition of This Week in Law. We've got Ryan Morrison, Ross Hersman, and Lauren Hanley-Brady joining me. We're going to talk about violence in video games, bad behavior by the players themselves. We're going to talk about some intellectual property concerns too. Can you pirate your own video game or encourage other people to do so? The burgeoning world of esports and much more next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, episode 290, recorded January 30th, 2015. I think that sword is a claymore. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by FreshBooks, the easy-to-use invoicing software perfect for your law firm and designed to help small business owners save time billing and get paid faster. Join over 5 million users running their businesses with ease. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash twill. Hi, folks. I'm Denise Howell, and thank you so much for joining us once again for This Week in Law. Because we've been doing it on a fairly regular basis lately uh, and having so much fun with it, we're doing it again. We're having an all gaming law episode of This Week in Law with all gaming lawyers or law students. Um, very hardcore geek crowd today, I'm proud to say, uh, flying our geek flags proudly. Uh, joining us from New York and the law offices of Ryan P. Morrison is Ryan P. Morrison. Hello, Ryan. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. Uh, you might know Ryan better as video game attorney on Reddit, where he does some very popular AMAs. Uh, great to have you here today. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, talk a little bit about it. It's an interesting subject. Yeah, it sure is. Um, also joining us is Ross Hersman. Now, if you've been watching our gaming episodes, you're familiar with Suzanne Jackyu, also known as Zed the Gamer. Uh, Ross is a friend of hers and uh, also a co-author of hers at the Loading Law site. Hi, Ross. Hi, thanks for having me. Also a co-student of Suzanne's, correct, at Chicago Kent? Uh, no, actually, I'm from the John Marshall Law School. I actually just graduated this last January. Ah, there we go. I'm glad I asked John Marshall. And uh, congratulations on joining the ranks of <laughs> former law students. Also a former law student is uh, Lauren Hanley Brady. Hello, Lauren. Hello. Thanks for having me. Uh, Lauren, you have your own practice, correct? Um, I was just recently barred in December and so ah, we're we still go. working on that. Great, great, great. Congratulations on passing the California bar. That is no small feat. Thank you so much. All right, so uh, let's get into it. We have all kinds of exciting uh, gaming law stuff to talk about. I was telling IRC before the show, I'm not a gamer myself, but I'm sort of an over-the-shoulder gamer uh, because uh, my son, like many his age, uh, is uh, very, very, very into video gaming. Um, would do it all the time if given the chance and choice. Uh, so I see a lot of it. And uh, as a lawyer interested in tech and intellectual property issues, what I see always makes me think of, whoa, that's going to be an interesting lawsuit uh, or dispute or what have you um, when it blossoms into that. So we're going to talk about some of that kind of stuff today. And I think we're going to start on the copyright front. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, when we did our last gaming-oriented show, we did a lot on Let's Play. Um, and maybe you guys should uh, straighten me out on my terminology. Um, I'm, I'm not quite clear as we roll into this discussion whether Let's Play is the same as just streaming the video of the game you are playing live. When I think of Let's Play videos, I'm thinking of people who capture their experience playing a game and then narrate it. And it's more of an on-demand thing than a live thing. Or am I drawing too thin a distinction? Yeah, uh, I think you those got are it right there. Yeah, those are that's basically the line. Also, you know, let's play videos are kind of where it started because uh, people didn't have access to streaming technology so easily, or there wasn't an audience for it. So they would pre-record videos, throw it on YouTube, and hope to get an audience. Now with things like Twitch, it's a little easier, and 
there's more of a live streaming audience that's growing. Right. So, but do you think it makes a difference, Ryan, in the legal issues? Only in arguments that are being made in the future, not yet. Uh, it, you know, if, if they're both looked at exactly the same currently, but there's a big argument being made for Let's Play videos as uh, transformative works, which I don't know how far back or early you want to start with copyright basics, but uh, the difference between uh, something infringing and something different is whether it's a derivative work or a transformative work. A derivative work means basically I can look at it, know the source, and there's going to be substantial similarities. There's consumer confusion. Uh, with a transformative work, it means you've changed it enough, you've, you've done enough things to it, that now it's its own thing and you can own it without it infringing. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people, myself included, T.L. Taylor up in Boston, who's not an attorney, but she's, you know, a, a, an absolute wonderful uh, academic with this stuff. We're, you know, we're, we're trying to tailor arguments to kind of prepare for upcoming litigation or, or just even legislation to make uh, Let's Play videos and, and eventually streaming videos uh, transformative where they are their own thing. And, and if you're playing a Nintendo video game, but streaming it and showing to your audience, Nintendo can't come and say you can't do that. So, but we're certainly not there yet. So right now they're the same thing legally. Right. As Ryan was saying, Lauren, uh, traditionally before Twitch um, and other things that made it easier to capture video live, what you would do is use some third party software to capture video as you were playing uh, on your machine. And then you would um, either include the commentary that you were doing live while you were playing, or maybe add some additional commentary, and then you would upload. Um, do you think it changes the game much? Obviously, Twitch is huge, but now Steam is getting into this game as well. I think it's a really good option for Steam to try and get the player base. Um, I mean, they already have a, um, you know, a, a fan base and being able to offer this service when people may not want to pay subscriptions to Twitch if they're available or maybe even stream it if they want to just play with their own group of friends and stream to each other. I think it's a really good way to reach that niche market. Um, as for like Let's Play videos, I mean, the more critical commentary that they add, the better off they will be. Um, but there's definitely going to be a lot of litigation for just streaming. But I think if um, Steam is offering that service, then they're giving a license. I assume there's some sort of license for allowing that kind of streaming. Right. I'm kind of curious how this is all working since Steam is just an aggregation, a platform for other people's games to reach consumers. Um, do you have any idea, Ross, uh, how they've managed to get permission or if they've managed to get permission from every single title that's on the Steam platform? I mean, they're the, kind of the gatekeepers for their service. So any game developers who want to be on Steam probably would want their games to be uh, streamed anyway. Um, it's a great way to market your games. It's a great way to get your name out there. Um, but it's very different from the console market to Steam and other online avenues like Twitch. Uh, Nintendo, I think just today, started confirming that they were going to do some revenue sharing with people streaming their own content. Microsoft uh, has a similar model. And now Steam, I think their process is still in beta. But I think from a game developer's perspective, it might be the best thing in the world. It might be terrible. It's, uh, it's going to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. So, Ryan, uh, again, not a gamer here, so you're going to have to um, clue me into how this works. But if you're using Twitch or Steam and you're broadcasting your game live and you're adding commentary, that's, that's one way in which your um, creation will get out to its audience. Do you have the ability on either of those platforms um, to save a copy locally and distribute it in other ways? Not through those services, but they're there have been issues where people were playing a game and then kind of sharing their password or beta key. There was actually just one of the most famous uh, World of Warcraft players ever uh, had his account permanently banned because he was letting people on his stream give them his account, give the, the people watching were giving him their accounts so he could try out their characters and different things. And as a result, he got banned and I believe the other accounts got banned. So it's up to these different companies to make their own rules, kind of trademark issues and copyright issues aside. And no one knows what's going on, really. They, they, everyone has a different set of rules. There is no laws yet. And uh, it's, it's a big question mark for, you know, even someone like myself to advise these guys because it's so difficult to know, you know, the reality of the law versus the theory of the law when it comes to these things. We're using laws written for newspapers to control the video game market. 
and it's uh, it's difficult. <laughs> Yeah, back up to what you were saying a moment ago about um, some sort of legal designation of Let's Play videos as a transformative work. How are you working on that? I mean, we're not doing anything as of yet. It's more uh, in, in preparation for when a lawsuit does come down for one of our clients or, or you know, I know T.L. Taylor, who I mentioned before, is working on th something and trying to get a team together to actually push it to different people to have it better looked at. But, mm -hmm. you know, the way our legal system works is it has to be before a judge before this can kind of be decided and it won't go before a judge unless there's an actual lawsuit. You can't go in front of a judge and say, what, what do you think? What's a rule here? Uh, you know, which is whether it's silly or not, that's just how it works. There has to be someone in trouble before we will look at it. Uh, so, you know, really time's going to tell, but it's, it's the basic, the argument's very basic. It, it's saying, you know, when these let's players or these streamers are playing their game, the people watching it are watching it as a different thing. They're not watching it instead of playing the game. They're watching it because that's what they want to do. It's the same as if when I watch the NFL, I'm not watching the NFL instead of playing football outside. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a, a transformative work on the very basic level in that way. And, and it's really just common practice in the reality of the world right now. Let's play videos and streamers are not going to go away. And if American businesses want to make money with this, then the American law needs to support that. Otherwise, they're just going to go to Europe or, or Asia and that'll be that for, you know, our bank accounts. <laughs> right. uh, as a quick aside, I'm not sponsored by Disney. I'm uh, displaced because of the blizzard and out of friends in his nursery. So I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't even see. Do you have like the map of Cinderella's? Yeah, the there's like a lot of princesses something. behind me. And <laughs> just Very wanted cute. to make that clear. I saw yes. that in the chat, so I wanted to clear that up. <laughs> you're, you're in, uh, what is it, um, uh, the Infinity game yeah, right, that exactly. Disney has? <laughs> you're playing that Download in the Download here. Yes. <laughs> um, Ross, you mentioned uh, Nintendo changing a stance. We were, we were just talking on our last um, video game law-oriented show uh, about Microsoft uh, releasing its rules for um, people making Let's Play videos. And Nintendo, up until very recently, just this week, um, had taken the stance that, hey, if you're doing Let's Play and uploading to YouTube or elsewhere, um, and we have the ability to uh, grab that ad revenue from you, we're going to do it. And so that's what Nintendo has been doing with YouTube videos is, um, you know, the content ID system Let's Nintendo know, ask them, do you want to take it down or do you want to have the ad revenue? And Nintendo up until this week has said, give us all the ad revenue. Now they're going to share that ad revenue with the uh, impresarios of the Let's Play videos um, if certain conditions are met, including uh, putting a disclaimer somewhere in the video or um, I guess alongside it would work too, uh, talking about how this isn't authorized by Nintendo, et cetera, et cetera. And it's uh, uh, being released under the creators program, I think it's called. Um, do you think, Ross... That someone out there, I mean, you, you were saying, yeah, the companies want people to do Let's Play. It drives a lot of traffic and interest in the games. Um, do you think that some Let's Play person out there might say, you know, I, who says I need to share revenue? I am making my own creation here. It's a completely transformative work. It's loosely based on the game, but I'm adding so much to it that there shouldn't be any need for me to share at all. Do you think someone mm -hmm. will test that? Oh, I think for sure. Um, first of all, I think most Let's Players don't even think about the legal definitions of what a transformative work is, what a derivative work is. They just want to uh, have a channel and talk about a game, play through a game, whether they're doing a tutorial on how to beat a particular boss or whether they're commenting on glitches. Um, they just really want to create something. So it gets a little bit complicated where eventually... Uh, we're going to have to test where that line is. Um, if you think about the differences between a director's commentary on a DVD or a Let's Play, uh, a lot of Let's Players will make the argument that a video game Let's Play is going to be a lot more 
interactive and a lot more transformative than a DVD commentary because it's going to be different every time you go through it. Enemies might spawn in a different place in a various game. So you're never going to be experiencing the same content. And the purpose of watching that Let's Play isn't seeing the game. It's hearing the commentary and seeing this unique interaction. Watching a DVD commentary, the film's going to stay the same every way. And even though you're listening to the you know, director's commentary or commentary from some of the actors, you're still watching the film. So I think what a lot of IP holders are concerned about is that Let's Players might be uploading game footage just for the sake to let people watch it and not really adding so much transformative work of their own. I think back to uh, Halo 3 game footage where people had the final uh, good ending cutscenes on YouTube you know, by mm -hmm. the next day already. Microsoft wanted to try and keep that on the download, you know, let preserve people's surprise when they finish the games themselves. They didn't want that out. So I think that's going to be the battle we're going to see eventually. We're going to have some reactive definitions to what's transformative and what's uh, what's not in Let's Plays. Ryan, what do you think about the argument that uh, Let's Players shouldn't have to share revenue? I, I think it's unfortunately a losing battle right now as as it sits. Uh, exactly for what Ross was saying. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's RPGs or, or story-driven games where you can watch a Let's Play video and know the ending and know the big, you know, reveal or the, the twist or turns makes you not want to play the game. It does. It's a spoiler. If you know a TV show, it's the same way you wouldn't watch that show. Uh, so that's going to be their main argument, that they're losing direct money from that, these, these companies. And unfortunately, the way, you know, our government looks at video games is, is all as one thing. There is not different genres. It's the way we look at music. It's the way we look at TV. It's the way we look at all forms of entertainment. It's just that form of entertainment. So if this is hurting role-playing games or story-driven games, it, you also won't be able to do it with Madden or sports games or things like that. So whether or not they need to be, you know, back to your original point, whether or not they need to be splitting revenue, I think we're going to get to the point where they're not going to get any revenue. Uh, and that, and maybe the lawsuits will start from their side, which is not what anyone's kind of predicting right now. But I just think it's a lot more realistic that they're all going to get shut down immediately. And, you know, one or two of the very popular streamers who's making, you know, not thousands a year, but millions a year is going to, to bring a very strong legal case against these companies and say, you know, I do have something transformative and I'll offer you this revenue share if we can agree to a compromise here. And I, that's the only way I see this progressing at all. Otherwise, it's going to be a pretty simple case of these, these companies that make the games own their intellectual property. This isn't transformative. And that's that. Lauren, we've been talking about uh, the transformative nature or not of Let's Play videos. And it occurs to me that another fair use factor uh, is education. And I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are on uh, the educational value of Let's Play videos and if, if that might also come into the mix. I mean, I think it's going to depend on what exactly the educational aspect is. I mean, I've watched mm -hmm. a lot of Let's Play videos for boss fights um, mm -hmm. and for uh, quest glitches and stuff. But I think the more that it is a full walkthrough of the entire game, even if there is commentary that may have a weaker argument than specific parts of the game. Um, I mean, educational. I mean, if you're doing a full game walkthrough and you're trying to argue that it's an educational piece of video, I mean, you'd have to really add some commentary that is actually educational, maybe um, critical analysis about the um, the content itself rather than just showing how to play the game. I don't know. I think that may be a bit of a stretch to try and do educational unless it is very specifically um, compartmentalized. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I don't know. I guess I'm sort of hearkening back to our last gaming law show where we were talking about how there are a couple of universities in the United States that are giving scholarships uh, related to their esports teams, I guess yeah, just because you have an esports team that you know football is football educational. I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, I as guess broken that would as be the analogy. I mean, as broken as the video game legal system is right now, competitive mm -hmm. gaming in esports is is it's not broken. It's downright criminal. It, it's basically mafia controlled. Uh, yes. it, it's you know I I have not seen a single esports contract that is not downright evil. 
Uh, <laughs> Hold if, that you know, thought. <laughs> I want to. I want to get into sure. that with you in detail. Um, I'll sure. go ahead and put our first MCLE passphrase into the show. It's going to be downright evil. <laughs> uh, why wouldn't it be? I forgot now uh, that I'm a lawyer. You can't quote everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, we put these phrases into the show for people who like to watch the show, not just because it's fun and informational, but because we, as lawyers and other professionals, have these. Uh, professional education requirements that um, need to be met from time to time so that if you're a lawyer, so you can keep your law license uh, and other people have to go through those hoops too. So um, we have information on how you can uh, request continuing legal education credit for the show. That's at wiki.twit.tv. And we put these phrases in because some jurisdictions like to have some concrete way of demonstrating that you actually watched or listened to the show and are not just writing it down on a list. Um, so downright evil is our first one. I want to do one more uh, copyright related story and then get into the world of esports, if you guys don't mind, because I think that's fascinating too. Uh, but this one just caught my radar, um, and I'm wondering what you guys think about it. It is uh, it concerns a game called Hotline Miami 2, uh, the sequel to Hotline Miami, uh, and it was going to be released in Australia. But Australia has a pretty restrictive local age rating system. And uh, this game includes a fictional rape scene. So the rating board in Australia said, sorry, we're just, we're not going to rate that one. We're not going to allow it to be released because I guess uh, their rating system doesn't just apply a rating to a very explicit game. It actually, you know, you have to meet some content guidelines, it sounds like, in order to even earn a rating. Um, so it's not going to be released there. But the game developer has come out and said, well, don't worry about it. Just pirate the game. And uh, even though you can't buy it legally there, go ahead and pirate it. We think you'll have fun playing it. Uh, Ryan, what do you think about that? I mean, if uh, there's two ways to look at that question. If you mean whether that game designers allowed to let people kind of circumvent the rating board and uh, pirate the game, then normally, yes, uh, the IP holder is allowed to create any kind of license he wants. If he says you can steal this game, you can steal this game. The hiccup with that, because a lot of game developers do that, is uh, sometimes these game developers are restricted by other licenses they've agreed to that they don't even realize, or they've agreed to distribution deals where they can't be doing this, but they, it doesn't stop them from offering it. Uh, that said, I, I am not completely familiar with Australia's law, so I don't know if this is how it works in America in the sense that we have the ESRB who rates our video games, but they're not a government body. They're a private kind of organization that we set up so a government body doesn't get created. We say we'll regulate ourselves in the gaming industry. We don't need Congress. We don't need any of that. Uh, you know, let us do our thing. And so far, so good. If Australia's is set up like that where it's a private entity, then this guy can go around that no problem. They have no real jurisdiction or, or power there. If it's an actual government agency and their ruling was specifically, you know, we're not going to rate this, we're not going to allow it to be sold here, that's also probably fine what he's doing. But if they have straight up said as a government agency that this game's not allowed to be played here, then he's probably breaking quite a few laws. Uh, again, as I, I, I hadn't looked this much into it because I just, you know, Australia we deal with very rarely oftentimes because of issues like this, they're, they're a headache to go through in, in every avenue. Uh, and it, it's amazing what gets through and what doesn't, that this game was blocked and some others have been sold there is, you know, an, another, I guess, conversation for another time. But it's, uh, it, it's he's probably well within his rights to do that and you're well within your rights to download it illegally through his sort, you know, however he set that up for them. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> right. Based off I, what I, it, yeah. I agree with you that the, the um, hitch in that, the potential legal hitch in that is whatever distribution or, you know, however else he's licensed out the rights, what other sub-licensees uh, there might be or assignees of the rights to the game that might say, whoa, wait a minute, no, you can't pirate our, this game, which, to which we also have rights. Uh, Ross, do you have any other thoughts? Absolutely. Um, it's not just a legal issue. It's also a PR issue and an economic issue. It sounds like if the game was banned in Australia, they weren't going to be able to sell it and get any revenue off it there anyway. So from a PR standpoint, making it available to hackers or uh, to torrenters, 
uh, to illegally download might be a great PR move on their point. They're going to get some street cred from their diehard fan base who wouldn't be able to get the game in Australia. Um, and they're going to get their product out there for great, you know, name brand recognition. At the same time, they're going to run across a lot of regulation issues. Um, I mean, if this is a government body regulating in Australia, which I believe it is, um, there's going to be strings attached to that. And there will probably be some kinds of repercussions that they're going to have to factor into, you know, is this a good idea or is it not? All right, Lauren, any thoughts on this, including uh, why the heck do we need a fictional rape scene in a game? <laughs> Unfair. Uh, <laughs> yes. Why do we need one indeed? Um, I mean, they're also going to have the issue if they wanted to release it in other countries um, and they mm -hmm. want to charge for it. If they've already made it um, free, basic, I mean, they say pirating. I assume there's government regulations that they can't just offer the game for free. And that's why they use the word pirating the game rather than just download for free. Um, but if they ever want to expand their game to other countries and they have a, a decent rating or actually a rating that allows them to release in those countries, it'd be interesting to see if they actually make any money off of it because, you know, people who are good at downloading could just find a, an Australian version and adapt it to their version. And I mean, it's a good PR move and maybe the next game they'll actually be able to, you know, get a rating and make money off of it by not including rape. <laughs> right. And, and B Swift in IRC is calling me on that question, seeing what, saying, why do we need fictional rape scenes in books? Excellent point. Ex exactly. Point and, taken. And <laughs> but, but, but in all seriousness, that's a very good point because that's, I, and I certainly hope I'm not coming off as uh, defending fictional rape here, but it's, uh, no. <laughs> no, I, what, what I wouldn't be good. Is, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't, no. Hotline Miami is uh it's a satirical game. It's set up. It, it's certainly not, there's worse in Grand Theft Auto, which is sold everywhere. There's worse in a plethora right. of games sold everywhere. There's worse on Game of Thrones, which is the highest rated show on TV. And yeah, there's mm -hmm. worse in any book you could read probably ever. Uh, it, it's just, it, it's a it's a very big double standard when it comes to games. What is, you know, sensationalized into bullet point headlines of, oh, this is a rape game or this is a murder game. You know, it's it's not. It's, a, it's especially in Hotline Miami's case, uh, I actually have not seen a specific Seen, and I, I normally don't like to comment on things without seeing it, so I'll preface it with that. But right. it's a game created entirely as satire on this kind of Vegas lifestyle and action game kind of feel. It, it uh, it's certainly not what you would immediately think of when you hear rape scene. I'm sure. Right. And uh, it so that it you know it's just an it's an unfair kind of uh, bullet point there. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I, I'm just, I'm still trying to wrap my own head around, you know, if there is a difference between a, a book and a TV show like Game of Thrones, um, where, you know, again, we have ratings and different things that apply to how you are able to access that content and what sort of judgments you can apply before doing so. Um, and, and, you know, as you say, in the US, we have the ESRB and, and, judgments can be can flow from there and it's pretty specific in what it will tell you about what's in the game in games like Grand Theft Auto. Um, you know what you're getting into when you buy or permit your offspring to play that game. Right. Um, but still I just I don't know. I've, I wonder if um, this is uh, the reason why it makes a bullet point headline is there is a qualitative difference between um, reading something, and uh, watching it passively um, and actively playing the role of the person carrying out the act. Um, I think that's why legislators, uh, judges, lawmakers um, don't necessarily see this as in the other category. Um, what do you think, Ross? Am I off base here? No, I don't think you are. Um, I think that's a conversation that's been going on for a long time. A lot of people like to say that you uh, interact with games, and I think that's very true. But I think that mm -hmm. uh, an interested person is going to interact with any form of media uh, that they're experiencing, whether that's music or books. I've always said that if you feel you don't interact with a book, you're not reading it right. Um, <laughs> try reading mm -hmm. Stephen King at 2 in the morning under the covers and tell me that you're not scared <laughs> and that your heart isn't racing. I mean, that's an interaction. And, right. Um, I think it's popular to say that video games are extremely more interactive just because you're holding a controller, you're, you know, being a puppet master for your in-game avatar. That's interactive, but I think that all media is interactive. And it's a total double standard against video games that they seem to be regulated differently against movies and books. We don't have an ESRB that, you know, uh, 
that regulates books. You know, you said Game of Thrones is a very popular TV show that comes with its own ratings for TV and for DVD and Blu-ray sales. There's nothing mm -hmm. to stop any kid from going to his local library and pulling that book off the shelf. I don't think uh, most parents would know what it is. And if the librarian saw a kid taking a book that big to the front desk, they'd kind of applaud him for, you know, getting a book that big. So right. I, I think that there are so many books that are freely accessible to kids. I think any book is a children's book if the children can read. Um, yeah. So it's just kind of interesting how one is logical to regulate and one isn't. You know, we would never think of regulating books that way for content in America. Right. And if you, and you know, if you think this is bad, yeah, sorry. If you think this is bad, uh, you know, wait, wait in 10 years when virtual reality really gets top notch. Yeah. I mean, I, I have clients <laughs> right now working on uh, virtual reality through the Oculus Rift in partners eventually with things like Fleshlight, where you're going for to sure. have an actual pornographic game uh, where you're going to mm -hmm. be having basically physical sex in that game and mentally stimulated as if it was real. So wait till our legislators and congressmen see what's coming down the pipeline in a few years. And right. there will be a big overhaul of this stuff. But yeah, this debate will definitely know, not go away. No, it's right. it's only going to get worse. And uh, but right now, something like Hotline Miami is just a, it's a poor graphics. It's a clearly satirical game. And there's mm -hmm. actual games out there like uh, I hate to even mention their name and give them any publicity. But there's a game called Hatred, which was made by a bunch of, for lack of a legal term, assholes in, uh, I believe. <laughs> I think that is uh, a legal term. <laughs> yeah, they they made a game where basically you're you're committing suicide by homicide, and you the game starts where he says some you know very cliched I'm a I'm a sad guy I'm gonna go kill everybody speech. You go outside and you very very viciously murder people in ways that like just haven't really been done in games. Uh, and, and, you know, they've said that they weren't trying to do art with this. They were just trying to do what they wanted. And those are the kind of games where we're going to have bad legislation. You know, everyone cries censorship, censorship, censorship. But if we don't, as an industry, shut these people down, then the legislators are going to come in. There's not First Amendment protections that are, you know, completely infallible here and going to protect us forever. If we let these idiots keep making games like this just to push the boundaries, eventually we're going to have very scary laws where you won't be allowed to raise your fist in a video game anymore. And, you know, show me a good military movie or book or, you know, Game of Thrones, for example, again, you know, we're, we're going to have very restrictive laws on video games sooner than later if, if we allow this to continue. So it's, it's, it's Ryan, sad. I kind of disagree because, I mean, Mortal Kombat came out 20 years ago and that was kind of the then equivalent of hatred now. And there, that, you know, no pushed equivalent. us towards getting an ESRB, <laughs> which even though it regulates games, allows us to have a lot of the violent content that we have because of that rating system. So, I mean, whether or not they intended this to be art or if they were just saying this is senseless violence in its purest sense, which I think they have, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that, you know, freedom of speech doesn't exist to protect what you like. It exists to, you know, protect what you hate, and that might be what this is. I mean, you're never going to find a more over the top annoying liberal enemy and I wish that free of speech freedom of speech could ring true forever but I also live in reality where it it doesn't and these games are it, there is no equivalent you know respectfully to Mortal Kombat it this game there's a scene where you you literally rip a baby out of a carriage shoot the mother in the head and, and kill the baby I mean that's oh, that's not that doesn't exist anymore and Steam for the first time ever said this game's too much we're not going to allow it on our platform there was a huge public outcry by people, you know, offended that there was anything censored anywhere. And it's now back on Steam. And hopefully it fails and does terrible. But it's the fact that it's being sold is a detriment to overall freedom. You know, I, I, I know all the sayings of free, exactly what you said. Freedom of speech isn't about protecting what you like. It's about protecting freedom of speech in general. But there's responsibility with freedom of speech. And there's, a, there's an idea that you really have to understand when you cross a line, you have to accept those repercussions. And if we as a community allow this company to cross that line, which we already have, then we need to accept those repercussions. Those repercussions are going to be laws that completely limit our freedom of speech. So we, we rang true for a week on one game and we shot ourselves in the foot for the future. And it, it's just a sad thing to see keep happening over and over again. But I think that the market will end up deciding it. Like, I don't think it's necessarily a legal conclusion that this kind of thing should be censored or pulled down. I just think that from an economic standpoint, people won't buy it if they don't want it. But I think that that's more controlling than Steam or, uh, you know, any other service that keeps games online. I, agree. I think we're okay. just... Oh, sorry. Yeah, Go sorry. Ahead. No, I, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, I think it was actually probably a bit of a, a mistake for them to pull that game. I mean, they do have two other games that I won't mention for the publicity issue um, that are just as bad. And no one was really... I mean, there are going to be the a-holes that play those games, that buy those games, that make those games. But hopefully it if they're left in the dark, if they're not given a lot of publicity like banning it, like taking it off the service, then they will likely um, end up failing on their own. But when they yanked it from the service, that just brought it to light. I mean, as soon as you ban something, everybody wants to know what it is. And then putting it back up, maybe over you know the next couple of months, the buzz will die down and eventually the, the game will fizzle. But I think um, when they took that one game down, but they left the other two games that were up there that were very similar in violence, um, it did seem kind of arbitrary that, you know, okay, you have standards sort of, but not across the board. So that's just my thought. I want to continue exploring this. I want to recognize that we've moved out of the realm of Sorry. copyright and into what I guess we can loosely call entertainment in the in the terms of uh, a game like Hatred. So um, let's play our pumper and continue. Uh, is the problem with something like Hatred and the other games that we're not mentioning the platform? where you also have a myriad of very family-friendly games. And, um, you know, I'd love to see the demographics on Steam. I'm sure it skews quite young. Um, is it a problem that of making a game like this available on that platform without further controls? What do you think of that, Ryan? Uh, that's an interesting question. I don't, I think it's more graphics, honestly. Uh, so whatever the platform is, I think it's a matter of how real that game feels or how real that game looks. I think, you know, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure what, what other games were referenced, but I can assume. And, uh, the, the big difference is those games didn't look real. Those games looked, had very poor graphics and they were a lot more cartoony in the killing. Uh, this is the first one where, you know, whatever platform it was released on, I think it is had does have a console uh, release and everything coming up. It, it's uh, which all have different rules and different regulations. I, I think it's just a matter of of this one looks real. It it is uh, completely over the top theatrically and how things are accomplished and done. And it's I do think it's one of a kind. Absolutely, I don't think there is an equivalent at all anywhere uh, that we've seen anyway in this this over the top. So. You know, does the platform matter? Yes, because, you know, Steam does have its own rules and it can do things like ban it or, or restrict it to certain age groups. But, you know, how easy is it to enter an older age and, and you know, pretend you're 18 when you're 12? It, it's uh, there's the real, real less realistic responsibility and then the legal responsibility. The legal responsibility is very easy to meet. And so I don't mm -hmm. think the platform matters here too much. And here's an example of um, this kind of issue crossing over into other kinds of media, Netflix. Um, families frequently share their Netflix account. Uh, individual family members usually don't have their own because they don't have to. And it's another, you know, however much you're pay paying a month. Um, we share a Netflix account in my home and out of curiosity and for historical value, even though it had been panned somewhat, I started watching uh, Marco Polo their original series uh, with great hopes that it might live up to some of the other great original stuff that they've done. Um, it's watchable. I, you know, it's, it's very much trying to be like Game of Thrones and it is very much trying to be outrageous sexually in the way that Game of Thrones is uh, with lots of naked paramours parading by, et cetera. So, you know, as an adult, I can make that decision and watch that programming or not based on, uh, and nobody has a problem with it. But because we're sharing as a family, it pops up as something that's been recently watched and is very readily available. Um, should other family members choose to click over and say, oh, Marco Polo, we learned about him in school <laughs> and <laughs> want to uh, go down that same path. So um, just like with the television where you can, you know, find, or the internet or anywhere else where a child can find themselves um, places where children shouldn't go. That's why I raised the the platform issue. Is is on Netflix the friction to get to that kind of content tent is virtually zero, as far as I can tell. Um, well, they added. On, I mean, yeah, in Netflix defense, mm -hmm. they added because Steam's trying something like this. Actually, they mm -hmm. added the uh, the kids profile where you can set mm -hmm. it where you have to 
put in a password to get your adult watched recently and things like that. And uh, the kids profile will only show kids content. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, that's, I don't know if that's working for Steam, honestly, but uh, Steam is, I mean, for Netflix, Steam's trying something like that, though, where they're having the family sharing program. You can share your game library with a couple other family members. And there's, you know, uh, if it's not implemented yet, I know it's being implemented uh, restrictions on I'm only going to share these games with my children or I'm only going to share this with my you know, wife, however it works. So they're trying. Uh, <laughs> it's just not there yet. Right. Uh, let's let's talk about what actually what, you know, the facts of this hatred controversy for people who haven't been following it. Uh, first of all, Lauren, I'm not sure what the difference is between Steam and Steam Greenlight. It's, Greenlight sounds like some sort of... Um, so Greenlight uh, is where uh, yeah. developers will post their games in hopes mm -hmm. that uh, Steam will promote it on their platform. Whereas Got Steam it. itself is where you buy the official um, games that are approved by Steam. So Greenlight's where the developers go, Steam platform regulars where all the consumers go. Right. So this got pulled down even from Greenlight, which sounds like um, not even available to the wider Steam audience. Is that right? Um, I don't know about that. Um, I'm yeah, not... right. Yeah. Okay. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So, it, and then after the controversy came up about uh, this is censorship and uh, should not have been removed, um, Valve co founder Gabe Newell apologized to the developer and wrote him an email saying, yesterday I heard we were taking hatred down from Greenlight. Since I wasn't up to speed, I asked around internally to find out why we had done that. It turns out that wasn't a good decision and we'll be putting hatred back up. My apologies to you and your team. Steam is about creating tools for content creators and customers. Good luck with your game, Gabe. So Ryan, uh, you think actually, despite the discussions we've had today about the full First Amendment protected nature of video games, that this was a mistake on Steam's uh, part to go ahead and put this back up. Yeah, I, I know I have a very unpopular opinion here. I, I'm on Twitter and Reddit, so people are not shy about telling me what, you know, a communist idiot I am. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I really, I just, you know, ideals aside, I, I'm a very, I try to be very realistic because I am, I am an attorney. I'm advising these, this community uh, you know, every week on Reddit or individually when they're my client on what I think is the best legal course. And yes, right now, video games are First Amendment protected, but that is just because of a current case that is, uh, you know, right now on top. Uh, more cases mm -hmm. will come down. That's going to be tested. And a game like this is the one that's going to have our Supreme Court say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is too much. We're not going to give this First Amendment protection. Uh, do I agree with that? No, I wish there was First Amendment across the board. But realistically, I know that that will never happen. This game will not be allowed to go forward if this reaches, uh, you know, Scalia's pen. It's it's just never going to get to the other side of that with freedom of uh, freedom of speech still standing strong in video games. So, you know, I hate myself for having this opinion, but it's it's unfortunately <laughs> just it's the realistic side of of this controversy right now. Right. And, and technically, this isn't a free speech issue when we're talking about a private entity like Steam as opposed to a government-imposed restriction. Steam can right. decide to let whatever on its platform that it wants. And it's, free speech isn't implicated because it's only government action uh, that triggers a free speech concern. Um, and I assume you guys all saw the comments from Justice K uh, Kagan about um, how close she came to uh, going the other way in the Brown versus EMA case last year, um, where there was a California law that was proposed um, that would have led to more restrictive uh, requirements on violent video games and sort of a squishier test on determining um, whether something was violent or not. And uh, the Supreme Court struck that down, struck down the California law and came down on the side of free speech, but uh, only by a 5-4 margin. And Kagan did not at all sound comfortable that she knew in her heart of hearts that she'd made the right decision. Uh, any thoughts on that, Lauren? I mean, it would have been, I mean, it was a, the... Um 
I believe it was the ESA, or the people defending the first, the freedom of speech in the video games. I mean, their main argument was uh, we don't do this kind of selective um, uh, banning on content in other types of media. It would only be in video games and they were not, um, it's just not really the the way that our system does things is we want to protect, you know, all types of media the same as we can. Um, I mean, it's a, I'm glad obviously that it came down the way that it did, but it is scary that there are games like the one that we were talking about that could possibly tip the scale if it did um, get up to the highest court and just hope that, you know, games like that are not as popular as the, the mainstream games. Right. Ross, any final thoughts on hatred and this controversy before we move on? Something raised uh, in the Brown case that I thought was kind of interesting is this discussion of whether or not violence qualifies as obscenity. Um, in America, we really don't have any issue regulating uh, what we would call obscene materials, which are usually sexually related uh, for children. We, we don't sell pornography to children. And I, I think that's a good idea. And I don't think anyone would really agree <laughs> with me or would disagree with me on that one. Um, mm -hmm. So the argument could be made that, you know, if violence is also obscene, that you know, there's a legal precedent involved that obscene materials can be regulated and not sold to children. Uh, so far, no one's really successfully made that argument yet, uh, either in a case or in legislation, to the best of my knowledge. But I, I think it sets a very dangerous precedent saying that we can or cannot decide to regulate some content differently from others, whether it's cross-media, saying we're going to regulate video games differently than we regulate books or films or virtual reality or whatever comes down the pipeline. Uh, or even within video games. I think it's, you know, overbroad and too strict at the same time. Where is violence contextually acceptable uh, and where is it not? You know, there are games out right now that are very violent that have literary, scientific, artistic, or political importance that, you know, that has purpose and that has worth beyond just being violent. And then there are games like Hatred, which may be violent just for violence sake. So I think regulating content just generally um, without being too overbroad, is, is generally a very dangerous thing to be doing when you're t citing specific examples. All right. Well, I promised we were going to get back to esports. We talked two shows ago about uh, the scholarships that a couple of United States colleges are offering. That doesn't mean that hundreds of other colleges who aren't offering scholarships don't also have esports teams. They do. Um, and esports is definitely a huge thing. There's uh, major league gaming. There are esports athletes. Recently, uh, following lobbying from Riot Games, the United States government decided to offer visas who that identify foreign esports professionals as professional athletes. So if you're not already paying attention to this, uh, do so now because it's a big deal. Uh, but uh, apparently, and and this is not the first time you've said this, Ryan. Uh, the the athletes are not being well taken care of as far as uh, their teams and the people who are signing them. The contracts you have said previously are downright evil. Um, you've looked at some of these contracts. I take it. Yeah, it's not that they're not being taken care of. It's that they're straight mm -hmm. up being taken advantage of. They, uh, yeah. they're, they're being robbed. Uh, I got into esports originally by being reached out to by, by some of the... He actually said I could use his name. He's very popular in the Dota 2 scene. Uh, he, he goes by the handle Cyborg Matt. Uh, he's not a player, but he's someone who would analyze Dota content, write some you know great articles on it. And uh, he was also popular on Reddit where, where you know, I kind of am a bigger part of that community. He sent me some of the top tier players who asked me not to use their names, but you know, these are the top of the top. These aren't low level guys who won a lot of money and never got paid. Their team just does not pay them. They come up with a million excuses. They say, oh, you owe us for this. Oh, that bag of Cheetos was a thousand dollars. You know, they just don't pay them ever. And they're out of luck. These are kids who weren't working under a contract. And if they are working under a contract, it's written with law that is not law. It's written with things that are just meant to look and be scary with absolutely no jurisdiction or power or, or legality to them on any level. I mean, you're in California, I believe, right? Yeah. Uh, and so these are every single one of these contracts has a non-compete clause, which is just outright not allowed in California. Right. So it, it's, uh, you know, th that and that's at a minimum. So these kids are, are scared thinking they're stuck to play for this team or no one else. This team's not paying them. And they're just, they really, they're afraid to talk to attorneys. They don't think to talk to attorneys. 
They don't, you know, I've offered pro bono services to go in with some of them for negotiations or to get an actual contract signed and they don't want to because they think they're actually being told by the, the team owners, if you bring in an attorney, we won't work with you. Oh, ah, uh, we knew that was going to happen. Well, at There's least we the battery. got... Yeah, some of Ryan's thoughts. We knew when we started the show that Ryan was on a laptop that had a quirky battery and that was not able to be charged. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, I know you're not on with us anymore, but uh, we've really appreciated your thoughts and we'll go ahead and uh, continue on with the conversation. Um, I'm wondering, Lauren, have you had any exposure to these esports contracts that Ryan was discussing? Um, I don't have it, haven't seen them, but I highly um, imagine that the players are very much like the cow and the contract holders are very much the farmer. Um, it's mm -hmm. probably very similar to the gold farming um, communities out in uh, Asia and some of the other continents that have these people that are pretty much locked in to, you know, they only, they have one skill and someone knows how to make money off of that skill and they're pretty much beholden. I mean, I, I would liken it probably to a new artist um, with a recording mm -hmm. agency. I mean, obviously not to that degree. There are a lot of lawyers who'd be willing to take up um, the cases of an artist being taken advantage of in this country, but in other countries, they're probably not that kind of legal community willing to step up for the players. So, you know, they, they get what they get and, you know, hope that eventually they can retire and be left alone and actually have some money on the end. Yeah, it, Ross, you know, we certainly have um, some rules in place to prevent people from being taken advantage of contractually. Uh, do you think, first of all, as, as Ryan was saying, some of these players don't even have contracts. So there, there would be a starting point to at least um, mm -hmm. bring the educational level up to the point where there are some written terms uh, between players and their teams. But if those terms are completely skewed against the players, um, do you think that principles like unconscionability uh, will come into play here to help? Absolutely. Unfortunately, this kind of situation with esports and video game players trying to go pro, whether in uh, Major League Gaming or other venues, it's all too common and it's been going on almost as long as gaming has been around. I mean, we've had video game tournaments since the early 1980s. Um, I think of a couple players from the Twin Galaxies arcade that were in the Chasing Ghosts documentary who were part of a traveling tournament that their their paychecks got bounced. They had to pay their own flights back home when, you know, the thing went belly up. Um, and that kind of thing is just all too common where a lot of these players, you know, a lot of them are kind of young. They're, they're kind of in their, uh, in their late teens or, or early 20s. And just the draw of going going pro, being a professional gamer, it, it still has kind of this sexy celebrity to it where it's not a tried and true thing. It hasn't been around that long. It's not like going pro in baseball. You know, we, we have kind of an established set of rules and guidelines for how to do that uh, that protects players and that also protects, you know, the league. But for video games, I think just that sexy draw of going pro and being a professional gamer it might cloud some of those players' judgments where they might willingly enter into a contract or oral agreement where they agree to play for only one team, they agree to only be paid a certain amount because just that draw of doing what they love for a living just kind of counterbalances everything else. And I think it's really important as this industry gets started and continues on and there continue to be more people who are going to protect their interests that you know people like Ryan do protect their interests and help them out negotiating fairer shakes in their contracts. Yeah, it strikes me as a, a strong parallel, not only to um, indie music artists or up and coming music artists, but sure. in, in California, we have a lot of folks who like to surf and skateboard and um, there's sort of a, a thriving cottage industry in taking those smaller niche sports pro um, and paying those athletes and I'm sure they've, you know, had their growing pains in those industries as well as, as they've figured out um, how not to have the athletes themselves taken advantage of, I guess, you know, now, especially with Disney now doing a show called The Gamer's Guide to Pretty Much Everything that is all about a young esports player. And uh, the press release sounds kind of comical. The guy um, has an injury, a thumb injury. <laughs> that Don't laugh about that. From... That could be career threatening. Yeah, I know. I know it could. Um, so he has to go back to school and, and figure out, you know, how to maintain his esports career and uh, live as a normal teenager. Sounds a bit hokey, but um, Disney actually says they're going to be including gaming footage in the show. And 
uh, that if nothing else, this show will have an audience on the Disney Channel. You know, if you've got kids of a certain age and the Disney Channel, you know that those shows get watched. Um, and we'll definitely publicize the whole notion that, hey, if you're good at video games, uh, you can do this professionally. So more and more kids will be exposed to the concept that um, this is an option for them. And uh, so again, we have to make sure that one way or another, the industry matures in a way that's not taking advantage uh, with downright evil contracts or um, <laughs> otherwise no contracts. Um, any more thoughts on esports, Lauren? Um, just for like the the Disney Video Channel, um, that uh, the new TV show that they have, I I hadn't heard that they were going to add actual game footage, which makes I think a huge difference. Because I was originally looking at the little blurb about it, and I mean, for anyone who's into esports, it's not going to be hardcore enough. And yeah. for anyone who's not into video games, obviously this game isn't, or this video um, TV show is not going to um, really work for them. They're not going to be interested in it. So it would be, I mean, they're going to have to find a, a right balance of if they actually have license to use an actual games, um, you know, terminology and, you know, characters and actual footage, then I think it'll make it a lot more engaging for those who actually do enjoy video games rather than just talking about it. Um, as much as I love the guild, you know, the lack of some in the earlier um, seasons when they didn't show any of the footage, I mean, obviously they were in, you know, they're talking about a specific kind of game, but um mm -hmm. You know, the less that they can talk about the actual game itself, the less engaging it is. So it, it'll be interesting to see what they do with that show. Let me correct myself because I misspoke what the actual uh, press release says. They're not, it sounds like they have not jumped through the hoops of licensing actual game footage from actual games. You're right, that would make it far more realistic and, and strike a chord with people who play those games. What they say is... They're going to, here it is. We are bringing the video game universe to life and giving our popular multi-camera series a fresh new twist by integrating gaming visual effects into each ah. episode. So they're going to try and make it look like actual game footage, but it doesn't sound like they've gone to the trouble of uh, the next step, uh, the well, licensing. That makes sense. They, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's only so many games that really do esports, And so mm -hmm. if they specifically form the show around one game, they're going to risk alienating people who are interested in the other games that do esports. So it'll be right. very, very mainstream, but that's fine. For sure. Well, let's talk about that and, and bring in the themes we were talking about earlier about how, you know, there are some very controversial games out there um, that nevertheless find an audience. Um, what makes a good esports game, and what if someone tried to form an esports uh, league around something like hatred? <laughs> uh, well, there would definitely, I think, would have to be a lot more uh, multiplayer action because the whole point of esports is that you're playing against mm -hmm. others or you're playing against the computer. Um, more likely, testing your skills against other players is of more interest, but there has to be a wide enough fan base that people can actually get good because if it's a smaller game, yeah, you can be okay at the game, but the larger the population base, the more players you can test your skills against and the better you actually get. So I think having a limited fan base would really limit the ability for a game to become an esports um, phenomena. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's the really big one? League of something? Legends. League, League of, of Legends. Legends. Yes. Uh, tell me about that game and why, why does it make such a good esports game? I think that uh, for any game yeah, to be a really right. successful esports game, it just has to be fun. The people play games to have fun. And League of Legends, I, I wish that I had played more of it. I don't have quite the time uh, <laughs> that I would like to, to be playing League of Legends, uh, or the skill for that matter. But that game especially, it's got a huge community. It's got a great user base uh, that, that's very friendly and open. And like many other games like it, it's just it's fun to play. That's what brings people together. And that's why people will watch Let's Plays for League of Legends, because they want to see... Uh, what's happening in the community, and it, it's just this great network together that people want to follow. So I think any esports game, it has to be multiplayer, it has to be fun to play, it has to be easy to access, and it just has to have a very wide user base. Um, so that's why you know things like World of Warcraft, Counter Strike, uh, and any MMORPG that has a huge fan base attached to it. That that's why it has a huge fan base attached to it. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, we definitely have one other um, topic under this category I'd like to get to, and that is right of publicity, which always comes up when we're talking about video game law. 
before we get there, I'm going to put our second MCLE passphrase into the show. Let's make it League of Legends. Uh, so there you go. We've got two of them in the show. If you need to demonstrate that you've watched or listened to the show for continuing legal or other uh, professional education credit. And let's thank our sponsor for this episode of This Week in Law, which is FreshBooks. We talk about FreshBooks a lot on the show. I use it in my law practice. It is both time capturing software for individuals uh, like attorneys who bill their time, uh, who capture the amount of time that they've spent on a task and get paid that way. It does that for you. And uh, once that time is captured, it very nicely, very seamlessly generates an invoice uh, with the detailed description of your time, uh, manages everything online for you and gets that invoice out to your client and gets paid. Um, it's, it sounds like a simple, simple product, but it's very well thought out. Uh, it works in, it almost works in the background as far as your law practice or your other business goes. Um, if you're using a watch to try and capture the time that you're keeping in that kind of business uh, or the clock on your computer and then taking down notes, that you don't need to do that anymore. You just run FreshBooks on your phone, you start the timer, you go, and then it captures that time and puts it right into the right invoice for the right client. Uh, it's built for growing businesses. On average, FreshBooks customers double their revenue in the first 24 months. That's a big deal. Twice the revenue over two years uh, is nothing to sneeze at. And uh, not only is the money coming in in greater volume, but an average of five days faster. So um, great benefits all around with that. If you're using Word or Excel or Google Docs or some other sort of spreadsheet or word processor to do your invoices, just reflect for a moment on how unprofessional that looks. The great thing about FreshBooks is it's very, very reasonably priced for a small business. And there's just no excuse for not having a professional invoice under those circumstances. It's the easiest way to create those professional looking invoices in just minutes. And you know, when you have a client who's just kind of forgotten about paying you, or maybe they're having a tough month or whatever, and you need to remind them, uh, actually FreshBooks will help you do that in an automated way. So you don't feel like the jerk when you're picking up the phone and trying to dun your client to get you to pay you. Um, you can set up recurring profiles. And uh, if you have certain tasks that you perform every month and get paid for every month, those just go out automatically. You put it on autopilot and you're gonna get paid. Uh, you also, obviously when you're doing that, spend less time on paperwork. Uh, FreshBooks customers can free up to two days per month up to focus on the work that they love. Uh, do you keep your receipts in a box? Don't do that. Uh, or in a cupboard or wherever your receipts might live. What you can do more efficiently is snap photos of those receipts right from your phone. And once again, those expenses are captured and go right on the proper invoice that then goes out to your client. You can access complete financial records so you can keep track of expenses and be ready for tax time. Hello, right around the corner. And it integrates with the apps that you're already using like Google Apps, PayPal, Stripe, MailChimp, Fundbox, Zen Payroll, and more. If you ever need help, when you call up FreshBooks, guess what? You're going to talk to a real person every time and support is free forever. So you've got to give it a try right now for free with no obligation. You'll get a 30-day free trial by going to freshbooks.com slash twill. And don't forget to enter This Week in Law when they ask you how you heard about them. Uh, it helps us a lot. Let's FreshBooks know that you're a fan of the show. We're a fan of you for supporting our sponsors. And we're a fan of FreshBooks for supporting This Week in Law. Thanks so much, FreshBooks. We greatly appreciate it. All right, let's uh, talk about right of publicity issues. Um, we mentioned uh, Glorious Leader a couple of shows ago and Dennis Rodman. Uh, Ross, you wanted to talk about that. So um, tell us about... Uh, for people who missed this show, what's going on there and uh, if there are any new developments. For sure. Well, it looks like the game isn't going to be released now. Um, mm -hmm. But for the uninitiated, what happened was, uh, I think a lot of us know, Dennis Rodman was having some kind of political ties or uh, ambassador status unofficially with North Korea and was meeting with Kim Jong-un a couple of times. So a game came out that was called Glorious Leader that had him either as a playable character or he was available in the game. Um, 
that he was not affiliated with in any way. So when he heard the game was going to be released, he, I think it was to TMZ, but he started releasing a couple statements that if the game was released, he might initiate legal action for right of publicity. He didn't want to uh, be associated with it. Um, I think the latest now is that the game is not going to be released, so it's a bit of a moot point, but it was kind of the latest of a series of right of publicity issues of celebrities being inserted into games uh, where they didn't want to be. Another um, another high-profile case about right of publicity was the Lindsay Lohan Grand Theft Auto case. She's trying to say that she was uh, her likeness was used in that game, and that's kind of the uphill battle she's fighting right now. But it really mm -hmm. seems like right of publicity is going to be the hot topic for a lot of video game lawsuits in the near future. And it, it intersects with these issues of free speech that we were talking about earlier in the show because uh, there's a lot of confusion about uh, whether uh, one's right of publicity trumps a, dev a game developer's right to um, create something artistic that may resemble you. Um, Professor J Eugene Volokh at UCLA has commented on the confusion around right of publicity law in video games. And he says that the trouble is different courts have drawn different lines. And roughly speaking, there's authority for at least five different rules. Um, as you were talking, Ross, I was reminded of the Manu Manuel Noriega uh, case uh, where uh, imprisoned, deposed leader Manu Manuel Noriega uh, was upset with his own portrayal in um, which game was it? Was it one of, one of the Call of Duty games, maybe? Or I think it was uh, the latest Call of Duty, yeah. It yeah. was the Black Ops 2. Right. Right. Um, not a fan of uh, the fact that he's pretty clearly depicted in that game when you look at the graphics. Uh, but the court said that there was actually a free speech right here um, to uh, go ahead and portray him in the game. Um, so... What do you think, Lauren, of the friction between those two interests? I mean, obviously, the the person being portrayed is generally going to um, oppose it if they're not being portrayed in a positive light. Um, so a dictator being deposed or um, shown as being a evil dictator in a video game is likely not going to approve that. But um, that's the problem with the rights of publicity laws, as the professor at UCLA stated, was because it's state law. And so there are 50 different states that can make, I mean, they haven't made, I mean, obviously there's districts, um, but eventually this is going to have to be brought up to the Supreme Court to make some sort of um, codified rule as to what the, the lines are for rights of publicity. But, you know, portraying someone in you know, a realistic fashion of the the role that they played in real life, like that patent case. Um, it's definitely gonna gonna be some interesting case law to see what comes down, but it also has the risk of being some really bad case law that could affect, um, as it states in the article, uh, more than just video games. It could include, um, especially for like docudramas um, and a lot of other areas of media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always an interesting uh, thing to watch because whether it's an athlete or a dictator or um, a, a, an actress who's not happy um, about her portrayal in a game, um, this seems to come up quite frequently. And uh, again, the cases are all over the map. Um, let's shift gears for a moment. I am so sad that we lost Ryan, but he um, has been involved in a bit of a kerfuffle with Reddit where he is a big part of the community. And I thought it was at least worth touching on in the show today. And I, I do hope to have Ryan back soon um, so we can touch on it with him as well. But I want to get more into um, areas that involve the social web here. So uh, Ryan is uh, the video game attorney, video game attorney, no the, on Reddit, and uh, does a lot of popular AMAs there uh, with developers and others who have questions about things like we're discussing on the show today and in even greater detail, um, and has actually had some pushback from Reddit. And interestingly, it sounds like not from the New York bar or any other kind of attorney ethical uh, body. Um, Reddit has uh, come to Ryan and I'm not sure if they, they pulled down his account or um, 
restricted his ability to do these AMAs. Maybe you guys are more versed in it than I am. Um, but one way or another, Reddit has this policy where if you're um, using Reddit for your own commercial gain, uh, then you have to be, uh, it's a, only a certain percentage of your usage. Am I getting that right, Lauren? I think yeah. it's 10% maybe. Yeah. 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 Right. I think it wasn't active enough outside of his commercial use. Mm-hmm. So um, this this seems like a kind of an arbitrary line to draw and and uh, points out how difficult it is to be a lawyer with an online presence um, because not only Reddit, but some of the um, regulatory bodies for lawyers uh, require you to make a bunch of disclosures if what you are doing is in fact advertising. Um, and I, I guess that's kind of what the Reddit thrust to Ryan was, is you're using this too much for self-promotional as a self-promotional avenue and, and you know, knock it off. So um, what do you guys think about drawing the line between, you know, I mean, he's performing a pretty great service there on Reddit by uh, providing a lot of good information and interaction on legal issues um, what do you think about uh, lawyers and their online activities in general, Ross? I think it's something that like the ABA and regulatory bodies for attorneys and their professional responsibility rules, it's something we really haven't covered yet. It's something very new, um, mm -hmm. you know, and it changes from state to state. All 50 states have their own rules on what is attorney advertising, how they can advertise, whether or not they can be in television commercials, have ads in the newspaper, and, and that varies so much. So when you try to have an online presence, uh, you're running the risk of violating those rules in any of the states. Now, what was so interesting about what happened with Ryan, I think it was really unfortunate, was, <laughs> I, I have to say first before Reddit kills me, I love Reddit. I'm a long-term lurker and I love AMAs. Um, but the mods on Reddit determined, I think, that uh, that, Re that Ryan's AMAs were more self-promotion than they were not, I suppose, um, despite a 90% upvote rating, which I thought was kind of funny. But I think that it's a new reality for a lot of attorneys that this is going to be something that has to be decided soon in what ways attorneys can advertise online and what ways they can have an online presence. You know, most law firms and attorneys, whether they're, you know, big 700 attorney firms or solo practitioners have a website, have a blog, uh, speak regularly at conventions and events or podcasts like this. And it's, uh, it's something that we're going to have to look into and something I don't know if it's on the ABA's radar yet, um, but it will be soon. All right. Hey, I'm going to uh, make a note to Zach in the studio that uh, IRC is telling me that Ryan might have um, a computer that has a battery <laughs> that he can use and is back on Skype. So Zach, if you can get him back into this discussion, that would be great. Uh, give it a try if you can. Um, Lauren, what do you think about uh, lawyers and their online activities? Uh, it, it must be something that's near and dear to your heart as um, someone just starting in the legal profession and someone who's quite active online. Yeah, um, it's really, really a shame. I've actually read through a lot of um, his, all well, the last, I think, three uh, AMAs that he did, the, if anyone doesn't know, that's asked me anything. Um, and I mean, he's, the, the questions are, I mean, they use the Reddit fan base, so all the developers can ask him. I mean, the questions that they're asking are basically copyright law, trademark law, um, basic uh, questions on, you know, rights of publicity. And he's very clear. I mean, he can only really talk about general things. He never talked about cases. So I mm -hmm. guess I can see why they would think that it was, you know, attorney advertising. If, you know, they had a specific issue, he would say, contact me. But I mean, the entire AMA thread didn't seem to really be promoting um, him as, I don't know. It, it was definitely a fine line. I mean, it's up to the mods to decide. But um, I mean, I'm really interested in educating game developers as well. And I know a lot of the um, game attorneys that are out there, I mean, it's a small community and they're very interested in educating the the developer base because, you know, the better informed they are about the laws that affect their game, the more likely they are to get legal help sooner um, before a problem actually occurs. Um, I mean, they won't necessarily be able to fix the problems, but they'll at least know when to go ask the questions that they need to ask. So, um, I mean, I, I have a blog for... Um, on certain issues that I've seen, but I know a lot of other attorneys will have blogs that are just educational tidbits about things that are, you know, about the law that 
users may actually find interesting. And it's a shame. I mean, they really are going to have to clarify what constitutes attorney advertising for blogs, for the AMA threads like that, for the, you know, catch up to technology. It's going to be tough for them to do that anytime soon. Right. Well, we certainly have time to come back to this if we can get Ryan back on Skype. And uh, I'm hoping that we're working on that. I actually that. believe Yay. I'm here. Yay, Ooh. Ryan's here. Welcome back. You're back. Rising I, uh, from the dead. Yeah, He's I apologize blind. for that. I uh, I was displaced with the blizzard and uh, was using my friend's equipment and he doesn't have a laptop charger that is working. <laughs> yes, I love that we've had a guest respawn in our in our gaming show. So um, tell us tell us about this kerfuffle with Reddit. Uh, which oh right. Uh, so the uh, <laughs> it, to be clear, I do my AMAs in uh, the game developer subreddit. It's a smaller one, mm -hmm. uh, but it's for just game developers, and they've been absolutely amazing. The moderators there are great. They've they've never had any kind of qualms with me or or doing there. Quite the opposite. They encourage it. They they help me set those up and and uh you know they've been wonderful the issue is there is no kind of kings of reddit there's the there's groups that are moderators of other other subreddits and forums and they like to kind of police things that aren't theirs and they've sent me messages saying they're going to report me to kind of uh everyone else and try to get me taken down because you know in their eyes there's this reddit self-promotion rule that says only 10 percent of what you post can be about yourself I'm not mm -hmm. posting these AMAs, you know, to market myself, even though, of course, it turns into clients and things like that. Uh, I don't hide that. I'm very happy to work with them. But at the end of the day, I do it because I'm a passionate gamer. I, I do a lot of pro bono work with people, and I like to just answer the questions. I have fun with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, you know, it's been a bit of a headache hearing that from other, other mm -hmm. subreddits, they're called. Right. Uh, it, and it, you've never had any flack from, say, the New York State Bar or your local bar association about your um, activities on Reddit, have you? No, I actually reached out to them before I started because I knew there was a lot of rules I had to follow. So I reached out to New York City Bar Association and kind of uh, went over with their ethics committee on on what exactly had to be in my disclaimer and, and what exactly had to... Uh, you know, what, what I could and couldn't say. That's why I'm very, I keep, I have to keep things as general as possible. I can't answer specific questions. That, that said, I can give a pretty good answer usually for what they're looking for. I just can't say, yes, your name isn't infringing, for example, you know? Right. All right. Well, I think it's a, a fascinating issue. I'm sorry that um, you're being curtailed in your activities <laughs> there because it seems like um, you're doing nothing but a wonderful public service there. And uh, yeah, I mean, th again, this is not um, a regulation on you, but a terms of service issue uh, and a policy decision on Reddit's part uh, that maybe needs to be rethought if they want more people, um, more professionals to share their knowledge in that platform because and, um, and they, they to be fair they are mm -hmm. there are posts from the the moderators private forums and things like that because mm -hmm. i'm a moderator in another forum so I, I can see those posts and you know it's not like they're secret they're they're very public knowledge where they're examining the rule and they're trying to figure out different ways to go about it but mm -hmm. there's no actual moves being made there's nothing being done and it's just hurting the gaming communities you know or, or other communities it's it's uh you know, it's very, very silly that a, a website driven on community voting is being told that the community is wrong on what they want to see. I, I basically have a 97 percent approval rating from the readers. I, I usually make it to the front page. It's you know, they're very well received and they're being told that they're being tricked by me and they shouldn't be reading it. Right. Basically, right. <laughs> how exactly is is Reddit's policy curtailing what you would otherwise be doing? Uh, it, it's it's uh, I mean, it's it. it I there I don't know why I just started like that. So there's mm -hmm. three different bigger categories where people constantly beg me to post that have millions of readers instead of hundreds of thousands of readers. And those millions of readers, I, you know, not that every one of them is sending it to me, but but bigger people in those communities are saying, we really wish you would post on the, the bigger gaming subreddit, or we really wish you would do another huge AMA instead of the one in the smaller game dev that only the game developers see. Uh, I did one last year. It was, you know, in the top 25 of, of for the year of all, you know, it beat Bill Cosby and others. That's a bad person to pull out, but it beat, you know, some big, <laughs> big celebrities. Uh, and, and it's just because it's an interesting thing. Video game law is a, a fun and exciting field. And, right. uh, 
you know, I am a Redditor, so I, I know how to interact with them and speak to them. And, and uh, you know, I think we all got a kick out of it. I, I loved answering it. I answered every question that was asked, and they liked answering it, uh, questioning. But mm-hmm. I'm not allowed to post there again anymore because it's it's uh, them saying it, I'm crossing the self-promotion route since I don't post pictures of kittens. I basically just do my AMAs. I post some other game news, and that's it. So it's, it. it's, it's, so it's hurting from a bigger audience seeing it, basically. Right. So that there's your solution, though. You just need to, uh, you know, incorporate post more cats. Import, post more cats, exactly. Yeah. Incorporate <laughs> other parts of your life, though. Maybe that's what they're saying. Mm. No, they they literally well, want me to like post things that have nothing to do with me. They want they want me to post like a funny meme I found find on another <laughs> internet. Yeah, right. it's it's a silly rule. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we've already spoken about one area of controversy. Uh, that plagues the video game industry, and that is um, the recurring question of, of violent games and what crosses the line and who gets access to it. Um, and another related area is not on the game developers, but on the players themselves. I wanted to spend a few moments talking with all of you about civility in game and uh, mm. interactions between people as they're playing. Um, there was a Time Magazine piece, uh, an op-ed there uh, discussing why reporting offensive players in online games is a losing battle. Uh, you wind up hurting yourself more than helping the community, uh, according to Laura Karuba, who um, wrote that piece for Time. Um, so I just wanted to um, get your guys' take on uh, policing the community of video games or moderating the community, maybe is a better word, and um, where we stand on that and and whether there are legal overtones to it, because I, it seems to me that there are. Um, so let's start with you, Ross. It's a hard thing to do. Uh, generally, no matter what network you're playing on, whether it's Xbox Live or the PlayStation Network, uh, Nintendo's network, Steam... Uh, I think the first rule is just don't be a jerk. You know, if you have something to say, try try to be good to everyone. But unfortunately, there are plenty of people who don't. Um, mm-hmm. So when it comes to regulating that kind of thing, it's very difficult when you're talking about thousands and thousands of thousands and thousands of users all talking at once, all in real time, uh, finding them after the fact if they say something offensive. Um, I mean, all of the console makers have made great strides in trying to police some of that content, uh, ways of keeping swears or ethnic slurs out of usernames on their networks. And all of that's kind of regulated by terms of service agreements and agreeing, you know, just saying, if you're going to use our service, you're not going to be harassing people. You're not going to be using ethnic slurs. You're not going to be swearing, uh, especially when there's children on, you know, a lot of these online networks. Mm-hmm. But it's a very hard thing to regulate in real time because there are just so many people and so few resources. I think that Microsoft has probably done the best with its Halo servers because they just have so much manpower behind it, but it's virtually impossible to keep that stuff in real time. So when you expand on that, if you would, for we non-gamers, does that mean the manpower that Microsoft is devoting um, has teams of people that are monitoring all the chat going on playing Halo? Uh, no, they definitely wouldn't have that kind of manpower, but just in responding to gamer complaints. So if ah. I'm playing Halo with someone else and they uh, they kill me and then send me a voice message telling me how much I suck and I submit a player review, uh, they're going to, the, the moderators, that is the, the host servers, are going to be able to address that complaint much more quickly on a very large title like Halo than they would on a much smaller game that doesn't have the same kind of resources. But regardless of the size, it's going to be something that is addressed after the fact usually or as a preventive measure. It's not something that they can do uh, just muting people live, for example. Right. Uh, Lauren, what do you think about uh, the opinion of this woman who wrote at Time Magazine uh, or time.com, I'm not sure if it was in the magazine, uh, that uh, you're actually, you're not doing much good for the community and you might actually be harming your own gaming experience uh, by reporting offensive players. I mean, her um, experience was with Lord of the Rings Online and um, mm-hmm. she was worried about um, if groups of, you know, players who want to play respectfully try and get the one or two um, trollers or whatever they are, the griefers, out of the game, it could in turn, I mean, those people do have friends. And so it could equally 
um, work out badly for those who want to play the game as it's meant to be played if enough support gets behind those people to, you know, report the good players. Um, my experiences in various games of, I mean, at least a lot of the games like World of Warcraft, you can ignore people. But over time, I think there's even a cap on how many people you can ignore. And so you can leave, you know, certain types of chat, but then you're kind of lessening your game experience if you can't see the things that you want to see, like if people are offering things for sale, um, if they're looking for groups. So you have, you're going to have the the few a-holes that just want to cause problems just because they can. And reporting them is always going to be an after the fact process. There's just, I mean, obviously you don't want to do a minority report thing where you censor people before they actually do anything, but um, yeah, it is definitely, it feels like a lo losing battle if you're on the, the, the bad side of being griefed by people who just want to make trouble. So Ryan, uh, in other areas of online interaction, section 230 of the communications decency act operates as a, a very large shield for, um, the platform provider, the, the provider of the area where people are interacting. Um, and with, some limited exceptions, uh, if you are providing that speech platform, uh, you're not responsible for the interactions uh, going on there if someone crosses the line and um, defames someone else or uh, otherwise harasses someone else. Um, does it apply in this forum as well? Yeah, it, it does, but there's uh, steps they have to follow, things they have to put in their terms of use, and, and uh, you know, Yule is... And just basic, you know, even down to DMCA regis uh, registration with, with getting an agent involved for just intellectual property. But mm -hmm. the problem is, you know, big games like Lord of the Rings or World of Warcraft or, or Dota, they all do that. They all have a lawyer they work with and it's all taken care of. The issue is these these indie games that explode overnight and suddenly have millions of users, they don't do that. They It's not that they're against having a lawyer. They just never thought about getting a lawyer. And they mm -hmm. haven't done those proper steps. They don't have a terms of service. They haven't registered an agent. And all of a sudden, you know, legally, by the letter of the law, they're liable for everything their users do then, which is terrifying. And, uh, you know, the, the, the simple answer is, you know, to, to consult an attorney to have things done properly and, and figure it out. The realistic issue is that, you know, one, they don't think to get an attorney. Two, they can't afford attorneys usually. And three, uh, or, or it's more they think they can't afford attorneys. And then three is... Uh, I'd say 99% of attorneys around right now just don't understand digital entertainment law and how it, how it affects these games, what, what, you know, what lines these games can't or can cross without needing different kind of repercussion, uh, different, uh, safeguards. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's a scary, it's a scary place to be an independent developer right now because there's no one holding your hand. And when, when these guys see success overnight, they're completely not prepared for it. That's that's why I do those Reddit things and think you know other other avenues like that. It's because it's important, and these guys need to know that while they not, might not be a AAA studio or, or a top of the line entertainment company, they legally absolutely have to uh, abide by the same laws. The laws hit them the same way, and they they act like they don't. Mm. Hey, Lauren, you have a great post, and I'm going to make it one of our resources of the week for this week. We have a couple of others as well that I'll hit on in a moment, but since um, it's pertinent to our discussion right now, your post is called Privacy Policies, Terms of Service, and EULA's Oh My um, from last December. Uh, and, and it's a great overview for, for those kinds of small game developers who might not have thought their way through these issues um, Mike, I encourage people to read through the whole thing uh, because it hits on a lot of stuff that if you are a small developer, you want to be thinking about. But um, I'd like to hone in on uh, one question that does flow from our discussion here, Lauren, and that is um, the privacy of user data. And uh, since we're talking about um, situations in which one user might be upset with another because of bad behavior that's gone on uh, online during the course of interactions and might want to actually pursue legal action against another player, uh, what sort of responsibility um, the gaming company, the developer, whoever um, has all the information about the players has to reveal that if someone comes to them and says, hey, we need to sue this person. Um, I think it's probably going to be, I mean, I would think it would be very similar to um, 
maybe the cable companies and people wanting to get information, personal information from them. Um, there are certain times where, uh, you know, developers or service providers need to give information, uh, personal information of some of their users, but some usually those tend to include warrants um, and official requests. Uh, if it's not governed in the, the terms of use, I mean, that is definitely a question that you would want to ask a lawyer and see if the situation does actually warrant it because, um, I mean, you owe a, a duty to protect the, you know, the, the data that your users give you. I mean, that's what your privacy policy is and that's what your terms of service says that you're going to use reasonable means usually to protect their information. So it's, um, it would definitely depend on, uh, what they want and whether or not you're willing to possibly be in court with that. And so you probably want to be as formal as possible and make sure that they get the proper, um, you know, means involved to actually get that information from you. Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to give you our other resources of the week. You can find links to all of these at delicious.com slash this week in law slash 290. Um, you can get all of our discussion points that we've been looking at in preparing for and going through the show today. Those, those are there as well. Um, so uh, the next resource I wanted to give you um, fits right in with what we've been discussing today and the uh, burgeoning role of virtual reality in the gaming world. Uh, the Sundance Film Festival is going on right now. And uh, although you think of independent film uh, and might have one framework for uh, what that means to you when you think of Sundance, uh, Sundance thinks about storytelling. Uh, as its uh, mission and what's going on in film. So as part of the festival, they have this great new frontier exhibition that I encourage people to check out online. Uh, it's uh, If you look for new frontier exhibition at Sundance, you'll find it. Um, and it's all about virtual reality this year. Uh, some really interesting things. One is called Birdly, where you can, um, it's this really hoking looking contraption that you lie down on face down with a VR headset on. And, but it looks like the experience you have is quite amazing where you're soaring over San Francisco uh, with a, literally a bird's eye view. And when you look at your arms, you see wings and you hear the sounds as you're soaring along. It looks really cool. And all of these um, various artistic installations that I think you can view physically if you're in Park City at Sundance. Um, uh, involve VR and uh, interactive storytelling in one way or another. So um, I wanted to bring it up because it has uh, little to do with gaming, more to do with film, but the same technologies, um, you know, might might well find their way into the gaming experience uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, and then our other resource of the week uh, is coming up at uh, in Chicago and uh, Ross is involved in the Chicago Video Game Law Summit. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Ross? Absolutely. Um, this is going to be sponsored by the John Marshall Law School in Chicago. Uh, Suzanne Jackie, who's been on this program before, and I are organizing this event. And it's going to be a day of academic panel discussions all about what we've been talking about today, all about video game law. We'll have panels on video game violence, uh, recent developments in video game law, game journalism, uh, game development, and also just the business of video games. So it's going to be a great opportunity if you want to learn more about video game law, what its current state is and what its future is. It's going to be a great way to find out about that. Um, and in addition, we're also going to be having what we're calling right now is a video game law museum, where we're going to be having some... Uh, patents, some video games, some consoles, and a whole lot of memorabilia directly related to the state of the industry um, about how video game law, where it came from, and why it is where it is. Wonderful. Thanks for that. I uh, wish I could go, but um, be sure and blog and tweet it and for all of us who would uh, love to see what's going on there and can't be there in person. Uh, we'll give you a tip of the week too. And the tip would be next time someone asks you what broadband is, you can tell them it's nothing less than 25 down and four up. Uh, that's what the FCC says anyway. The FCC just went ahead and reclassified what broadband is. Uh, this after um, a fairly recent reclassification in 2008, uh, at, at a much lower number. So the purpose of this is um, to help uh, 
get uh, providers of services like DSL to um, improve their networks to where they can actually be offering what the FCC considers broadband service. Uh, this is not to say that um, there's any sort of guarantee that anyone will get speeds like this, uh, but just have access to them, which is a slightly different question. Um, I know that uh, I do the show on less than 25 down and four up, and I'm suspecting that a lot of you um, have your online interactions at less than what uh, the FCC uh, now says is the minimum broadband requirement. But... Um, as the author of this piece, GigaOM says, uh, it seems prudent that the FCC does this, lest we regulate entire swaths of the country to slow or non-existent broadband while the rest of us go on to gigabit futures. So that seems to be the policy uh, behind what the FCC is doing here. And uh, if it hadn't hit your radar, now it has. And uh, I just can't tell you how excited I've been to talk with you all today. Love these issues. Think it's so interesting uh, what's going on with the gaming world. And, uh, you know, although the intersection of technology and law is always interesting, it's really, really cutting edge for what you guys do. And I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Ryan, uh, great to have you. Glad you could respawn and come back in. I'm very sorry about this. I'm incredibly embarrassed, but thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, now we even have your video too. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> so it, it, tell us now that we've uh, got you back and before we let you go, um, we know you're in New York, that you're very active on Reddit. Is there anything else you want to let people know about uh, before we sign off today? Uh, I'm actually speaking at uh, the Chicago Video Game Law Convention, so I'm excited for that. Cool. I'll be at GDC if uh, anyone there wants to, you know, say hi. And uh, other than that, yeah, I do the weekly AMA on Reddit, and you can see me on Twitter at Mr. Ryan Morris, and I, I link to all the stuff I'm doing there. Very cool. Thanks so much, Ryan, for joining us. Uh, thrilled that you could. And Lauren, great to meet you. And I don't want to let you go without having Zach in the studio actually show the wonderful graphic that you have representing uh, your online presence, your legal practice <laughs> at handleybradylaw.com. I just love this graphic. It's awesome because uh, Lauren is into long swords and uh, do, you, do you do uh, some long sword work yourself? I do. It's a German medieval longsword. The other option is Italian, but uh, we like the German because it's a bit more brute force and a little less uh, strategic. <laughs> it's more fun. right. No, 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 there's the graphic. It's Lady Justice with a longsword. How you, you know, you just can't <laughs> beat that. Um, you do. Do you do this in a LARPing kind of context, or no? Do you, no <laughs> oh God, no. no. I mean, no offense <laughs> to the, the LARPing communities. I just. Um, I was a film production major and I was always a producer. So I was always behind camera. I am not a fan of, uh, I can't act. Uh, so no, the, um, it's actually a martial arts class. And so we learned the, the techniques and, um, that you need that they would have used in medieval times while using a, a long sword. Absolutely love it. Uh, we have to do a whole show on that. I think <laughs> <laughs> on use of the German medieval long long sword that that might be a different show on the network. But thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate your insights into everything we've discussed. It was fun to be here, and I'll also be at GDC, and hope to see other people there as well. Wonderful. And uh, Ross, we know you've got your summit coming up. Anything else in Chicago you want to let us know about? Uh, no, just be sure to check out our website at Chicago. It's uh, cvgls.com. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's been a pleasure. There's more from you at Loading Law, correct? That's right. And uh, don't you and Suzanne also write jointly at one other place? It's slipping my we mind. We do. Right uh, you can check yeah. out my writing and Suzanne's either at Loading Law, Game Dev Law, uh, <laughs> also the former IGA, uh, IGDA Perspectives. And we mm -hmm. also have a podcast on YouTube occasionally. Excellent. Wonderful having you. Uh, great getting to meet you all. Thanks so much to you who have joined us today. If you've done so live, that means you've tuned in at 11 o'clock Pacific time, 1900 P uh, UTC. That's when we do this show every week and record it live. Love to have you live, but don't worry about it. Uh, you can join us whenever you'd like to by going to twit.tv slash twill. Our, our archive of shows is there. We're also on YouTube, on Roku, um, various other places. If you go to the twit.tv Twill page, uh, you'll learn how to subscribe to the show however you would like to. It's all there for you. Uh, what else is there for you? I let you know that we aggregate all our discussion points on Delicious for each show. 
uh, under the This Week in Law account and then by episode. Um, so you can always find uh, our information there. You can also get in touch with me between the shows. Uh, please email me. I'm Denise at twit.tv or give me a shout out on Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus. The show has uh, pages on both those platforms. Good places to um, let me know something that takes longer than 140 characters. Otherwise, Twitter works just great. Um, and that's about it. I've really enjoyed uh, chatting with our illustrious panel today, learning about uh, broadswords and violent <laughs> games. <laughs> and, uh, well, I hope to uh, bring this group again together in the future because it's been really, really fun. Thanks, everybody. Thank Definitely. you. Thank you. Take care.